welcome to the Survive, Scale, Soar podcast. Hear and learn through the success of others how to build the life and business you deserve. Learn to overcome failure, what it means to seek out growth, and how to become the best possible version of yourself. And now, here's your host, coach, entrepreneur, husband and father, and author of the number one best-selling book, Survive, Scale, Soar, Jeremy Williams. And welcome back. This is Jeremy Williams, and you're tuning in to the Survive, Scale, Soar podcast, the podcast for the entrepreneur built by entrepreneurs. Today is going to be a great show with guest Ken Mon, pastor of St. Mark's United Methodist Church in Baytown, Texas. Before I introduce our guest today, a reminder if today's episode moves you, makes you think differently, makes you laugh, or you know it may help someone, be sure to share it. Ken has been in the ministry since 1994, serving churches across the greater Houston area, Northeast Texas, as well as two Appalachian communities in rural Kentucky. He is a second generation pastor that sees himself as a personal evangelist for Jesus Christ, Mac computers, and Dodge trucks. Ken has been married to the love of his life, Kara, for 29 years, has two grown children and a couple of labradoodles. If you can't find Ken on his day off, you're sure to find him in a kayak fishing for reds and trout in Trinity Bay. And hey, Ken, welcome to the show. How are you today? Jeremy, I'm doing great. I've, I've looked forward to this for a while. Thanks for letting yeah. me come. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you being here. And we've, we've known each other for a long time. And um, gosh, it's been, it goes back before, I think even, even 2004, when uh, we first met starting up a faith quest and I kind of want to start our conversation there today is that okay. today's conversation is going to be talking about faith and faith in business and I thought what better person to have than Ken Munn he's a, a senior pastor at, at St. Mark's United Methodist Church down in Baytown Texas and you know I, I think one of the misconceptions a lot of people have is that being a minister of a church is something different than the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, can, you, can you talk about that? Well, I, um, I was an entrepreneur before I was a pastor. In fact, if you talk to your pastor, if you have one, uh, most pastors were something else before they became pastors. Very few go straight from uh, high school into ministry. Um, in college, I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I uh, worked hard toward that. I, uh, I started three or four businesses. It's hard to say how many businesses you start because you never know when you actually got it to be a business. Um, I sold t-shirts. Uh, we uh, cut t-shirt screens in the science and research building dark room in the basement because my buddy's dad had a key to it. He was a professor. Um, and we did a t-shirt business out of my dorm room. And, uh, we were fantastic. We were undercutting the fraternities. And then we actually sat down and did the numbers about six months in, and we were having a ball making a dollar and a quarter an hour. So uh, <laughs> was that a successful business? I don't know. It, it fired me up, though. Uh, when I went into architecture, I, uh, I got to a place where I was helping my clients, and I loved architecture, helping my clients with uh, building their house and building special things into it for special needs and helping them praying with them and helping them find a church and helping them find marital counseling as a 25 year old, you know, all the things you go to your architect for. And yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> at, uh, at some point I realized the part of architecture that I loved the best was uh, being with people, helping them in whatever way they needed. And the architecture was, uh, was really kind of getting in the way. Um, I, uh, I met my now wife while I was going through the discernment process of do I become a pastor. Um, one of the things that happened was uh, I got into pastoring. Uh, we got married and I went to Kentucky for graduate school for my honeymoon. And uh, what I discovered was that most of established church ministry is maintenance ministry on existing institutions. And what is called for in the job is not entrepreneurship. In fact, that scares people when they're trying to maintain 1975 and the pastor wants to be entrepreneurial. It is a, 
a misconnection. What do you what do you think caused what do you think caused that fear? Um, on their part, and I, I think it's not just church work. I think all all of us can get to a place where we remember the good times, forget the bad times, and we just wish things would be what they were. Then they become idolized at mine. Uh, that is a lot of rural uh, church work anywhere. Um, I have an atheist friend from college who, uh, for years, he's never gone to church. And we've talked back and forth. And one day he said to me, um, he said, what do you do for a living? Now, how do you explain to an atheist who's never been to church what you do as a pastor? Well, he's a marine biologist in uh, works for uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I think, I, I think that's what NOAA is. Mm -hmm. um, and he's an expert in six gill sharks that swim, you know, 20,000 feet deep or whatever. Who, who um, knew that was a thing? Th that's a thing. He got his doctorate in six gill sharks. Um, and so he asks me, all right, I've known you for a long time. What do you do for a living? What does a pastor do? And uh, I said to him, and, and I've, I've used this a lot since then. In his terminology, I said, I manage a relational ecosystem. And occasionally I earn the right to talk about God. Can you, can you say that? Can you say that again? That was really powerful. As a pastor, I manage a relational ecosystem. And occasionally I earn the right to talk about God. Um, That's that very was different. To him. I, I, yeah, I find that to be very different than, you know, what you hear or a lot of people perceive that, um, you know, the Christian faith or uh, a denomination or whatever the case may be, they, they feel like it's shoved down their throat and you're, you're welcoming, instead welcoming him to that conversation. And that, that's well, really cool. I am. I that. Well, part of, part of my own personal journey was that while I was in college trying to be an architect, um, and I was fairly good at it, by the way. I, I had a number of successes. In fact, I don't think I would have left to go be a pastor if I hadn't felt like I had been successful. Um, I, I worked for a, a company just before I left, and the boss called me in. I was wrestling with going to seminary and making the change. And he called me and he said, you're doing the best work I've ever seen you do. That both clients love you. The work you're producing is amazing. Um, I'd like to make you a junior partner in our firm, but before I do, I need to know why you don't want to be here. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa that's where a, does that come question. from? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I've been wrestling with um, a call to maybe being a pastor. And, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I didn't at that point, I didn't know my boss at all. Uh, at that level. It was all professional. So it was kind of a risk to say that to him. Um, and he said, oh, that makes perfect sense. Okay, well, you've got a job here until you want to go to seminary. Well, we'll carry you all the way up to that moment. And what I didn't know was that he was a deeply committed Christian. We just didn't talk about that when we we're drawing house plans. Um, and he did. He, he kept me employed until the day I, I said, okay, I'm going to get married and and drive to Kentucky for a honeymoon. Um, and uh, so that was, it was empowering to find other people of faith in the community. But as I was wrestling up to that point, I spent a couple of years as an atheist. I uh, arrogantly de decided God didn't exist and did my best to live that way for a couple of years. Not, uh, not to get away from anything, except I felt coerced into Christianity. Because most church life is a culture. And my dad was a pastor, and everybody assumed I would be a pastor. And I was running from that. But um, I had to kind of get to a place where, okay, I really can walk away from this. I'm not predestined to that. And once I knew that I could, I was free to be who I feel like I need to be. I realized I could do that just as well, helping people as a pastor as anything else. Um, that's and that's really powerful. Is is you know that I hear that a lot in talking about being the person we were meant to be or created to be, 
And sometimes we have that fear of, of stepping, stepping into it. Uh, we either have to have that affirmation or um, you know, that confirmation that that's where we need to be. And sometimes it keeps us from being who exactly we need to be or who, who God's called us to be. Well, and I will say it's hard to figure out what God wants. It's a whole lot easier to, to identify what I want and ask the question, <laughs> is this incompatible with what I think God wants? If I spend more time examining my own psyche and my own motivations than I do trying to figure out God, because honestly, uh, the best we're ever going to get, I believe, in understanding the Lord of the universe, largely is written in 66 books of the Bible. Um, they are all multiple source witnesses to who God is. They're glimpses. Um, but... Uh, I don't need personal revelation in vision for them. I got 400 pages in every book of the Bible. Um, so I spend more time trying to conform myself to what I think God wants as revealed in Scripture, which means, honestly, you have to spend some time in Scripture um, if you believe that. But um, I spend a lot more time working on my own self. I'm in my mid-50s now, and I have uh, – I've – I've been kicked in the teeth enough to, to, I'm starting to learn who I am. That, that there's a lot of hope in that. You know, we think, you know, I talked to my kids and, you know, their counselor at schools like already like, okay, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And, you know, being able to hear you say that you're in your fifties that, okay, now I'm trying to figure out who I, I really am is it takes a lot of pressure off. And I think those that are here in the audience that are listening is knowing that you don't have to have it figured out right now. Um, it, sometimes it takes time for that to, to be revealed. Um, you might be going down one path and then all of a sudden another door opens and you're, you're called to step through that. And so I think that's really refreshing. Now, so you, you win the ministry, obviously, and you started out in the rural areas and, and we met... And I can't remember the year. You'll have to refresh me on this. To, it was 04. Start. It, it was, I, I met you and you were just leaving uh, your work with the YMCA. Okay. And you, that was, I, um, so I started ministry about 10 years before that. And um, so what I was going to say earlier, I started ministry and went to these churches that were hiring. If they were hiring a pastor, they were hiring a pastor to maintain 1975. And, uh, you know, the world has moved on, but they didn't want that to happen. And they wanted me to bring back the glory days. Um, I will tell you, at 10 years, I was not fulfilled personally in ministry. Um, maintenance doesn't sit well with somebody who's basically entrepreneurial by nature. And uh, so I would have all these exciting ideas and the churches I served were like, whoa, whoa, slow down, slow down, young man. We, we've been doing this a long time, and uh, we've known Jesus longer than you've been alive. Um, and after about 10 years of ministry, I was married. I had two small kids. Uh, they were old enough to almost be back in school so my wife could go back to teaching uh, elementary school. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm to a place where I'm, I'm dry. I'm done. This isn't, this isn't feeding my spirit. I'm doing a good job. The churches are happy with the, with what I do, but I couldn't see doing this forever. And, uh, I, uh, there was a, a, uh, a graduate school program that had been advertised in my circles for a long time, a doctorate in church planting. I think it's technically in leadership and biblical preaching. But it was led by a church planter who started a church, took it to you know, 6,500 in, in worship, and uh, uh, he started a, a doctoral fellowship. So I applied for it. I figured they're going to take 15 people across the United States into this thing, and uh, there's no way I'm going to be one of the 15. You know, 200 people apply at least. Um, and Somehow or another, I got in, uh, but I got to that place where, okay, now I got into that thing. Do I 
stop my career for an entire year and move my country across my family across the country. Um, can, can, can I stop you for a second? Because I just heard something yeah. right there that, that that's powerful. Is you got to a place where you were you felt dry, your your spirit wasn't being nourished, and you applied for this opportunity that you thought there was no way it was gonna happen. And out of 200 applicants and there's 15 chosen, you're one of them. That's a that's a God thing. It I, it was a God thing. And I would not be in ministry now if it hadn't happened. Um, I, uh, but I di also didn't have the self image to really believe that I could do it. That wasn't, um, I didn't feel bad about myself. I've, I've been accused of being, <laughs> having a good size ego, but in the reality of things, you're doing nebulous things like ministry, which is mostly about people. And they ask you about God. And like I said, some of them knew God better than me. Uh, being a pastor is, for me, as much about being running the business of an organization. Uh, you know, I sell a product. It's just intangible. Um, but I have to believe in what I'm doing. I have to believe in what I'm uh, putting forth. And I've got to love the people I, I, I bring this to. Um, you know, atheists are close to my heart because I went through that period where I couldn't make God work in my life. Uh, I've tried to keep outside of the church people in my world on a regular basis. Um, and so I listened to podcasts and your book came out and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm reading this. Um, but I will say, and you said this in your book uh, about uh, finding a focus and being right there at the very beginning. I think it was your chapter one, uh, getting clarity. Well, I will tell you, my clarity has not been a global clarity for life. My clarity has shifted. I think um, I can't speak to everybody's leadership in their own life, but I realized early on that I need to pick something to chase. Uh, in City Slickers with Jack Palance, the old crusty cowboy. Great movie. He said, uh, yeah, he said, you have, to know, you have to figure out one thing. All right, well, what's that one thing? And he says, oh, you got to figure it out. I know my one thing. You've got to figure your own thing out. And I spent a good bit of time trying to deal with that. What I discovered was my one thing changes. But the important thing is that I have something that I've articulated to chase. When I was uh, in dry, dull maintenance ministry, I wanted to do entrepreneurial things. I And so... I named, I want to do something that's out of the box. I want to be free to let my inner child run with abandon into the surf. And I'm with a bunch of people who are wearing nice clothes and don't want to be at the beach. So they don't want me running in the surf. And they're certainly not going to follow me. And so I signed up to go and be a church planter, not because I knew what that meant. I just knew what I had. And at some point you say, I think it was Charles Dubois uh, said, uh, you've got to be ready at any moment to sacrifice what you are for what you could become. Hmm. And I think if you're dry, uh, that's where you are. Say, I, I don't know what I'm getting into, but I know what I've had. And I'm ready to lay it all on the line. And uh, you know, my favorite parable in scripture is in early part of Matthew. It's a one verse parable. Jesus says a man uh, was digging in a field and found a treasure and he covered it back up and went and sold everything he had and bought the field. Uh, sometimes you don't know what you're getting into, but you know what you've had. And I didn't want to let fear keep me from achieving something. And so uh, there's just a part of me that says, I'm going to put it all on the table that's burned me <laughs> a couple of times, but um, burned all of us. Uh, I have become aware that if we are all big boulders on the landscape and God is trying to move us in a direction, it's a whole lot easier to nudge a moving boulder that's already rolling to get back on track than it is to get one going from, from dead stop. And I've tried never to be a dead stop 
um, because there are things that God opens to those who are moving. He'll nudge us in the right direction. If we're sitting there waiting for God to give us a revelation, he's going to move on to those who are rolling. They're a whole lot easier to deal with. So I'm going to be the one that, that God can deal with and, and nudge me. Um, but so I went and did uh, church planting. I met you after a year of sabbatical. And they told me, if you go do this, if you step out of the corporate structure of our organization, the Methodist Church is run like the military. Um, every church is a duty station, but we actually work the organization. And uh, they told me, you're stepping out of the career ladder. You may go back to the smallest church we have. Uh, we got no promises. Well, and that's exactly what happened. They sent me to the smallest church they had, which was a neighborhood that had no church and said, uh, here's six weeks of salary, uh, get after it. And oh, by the way, Jeremy Williams is right over there. Why don't you talk to him? And so you were part of that first group of four or five or six families that I said, uh, hey, would you like to come and start a church with me? Um, and yeah, so meeting those, in, uh, on living room floors and, and moving yeah. around into different houses, doing some potlucks. I mean, it was, it was ground, it was, it was, the, it was the ground floor. Of, of starting something that, that became something bigger. I learned more about myself during that time than uh, any time in my life. It was just amazing. And uh, there, were, there, was a lot of, there were a lot of struggles. And, but the, the joy of victory is directly proportional to how much you put on the line. If you don't put anything on the line, the joy of succeeding is just about that much. But if you have uh, stepped out in faith, and most of the time it's half faith in God, half faith in yourself, because those things wax and wane. Um, but if you've laid it all out there and said, okay, I, I know what I've had. I don't know what I'm getting into, but I know what I've had. Um, the, your willingness to let go of everything and become something new the joy is proportional to how much you let go of. Yeah, it's, it's those things that you work the hardest for, the things that, you you know, you go against the grain and, you know, maybe even people aren't there to support you in it. And you sometimes feel alone. An entrepreneur oftentimes feels very, it's a, it's a lonely path and most people don't realize that. Uh, yet when you get to the other side and you start having those successes, like you said, it just means so much more and there's so much more joy in it. Yeah, well, your guest last week pointed out that entrepreneurship can be lonely at the beginning, um, but there is a payoff in relationship and joy at the end. I, uh, you know, as a pastor starting churches, I've now started three faith communities, um, and I would call them all successes in various ways because it's a church. We don't have the scorecard of income. If you're selling a widget, you know how much you made, and the scorecard is there, but Honestly, um, in your book, you, you pointed out that one of, one of the ways that a lot of the readers of your book and a lot of people in, in real estate are using finances as a scorecard. But honestly, if the money is the only reason you're doing it, uh, you're going to burn out. You don't do this because you want a seven-figure income. That's just the scorecard that helps you measure your progress. You're doing it because you love people. You want to help people get from where they are to where they could be. Um, and I love your love of those you coach. Um, that uh, that's, what, that's really what drives you. Um, in the pastorate, it's not money that has driven me. Um, I started out just wanting to get to a place where they would let me do entrepreneurial things and try new things. That focus shifted after Faith Quest. Uh, when we did that together and you moved on to other things, um, I stayed with that church for seven years. And uh, the focus shifted from getting to do something new to ministering to those who were really beyond the reach of normal church. So well, my do you think, one do you think thing, that's because a lot of churches these days, like they say they go beyond the walls, but they really don't. Uh, they're still still within the walls and everybody comes, everybody's happy. They, they tick it off uh, their checklist. They've been on a Sunday and you'll see them next Sunday, right? 
Uh, you yeah. did something yeah. different in that you went out to the people beyond the walls. We, uh, yeah, we talked about that. Do we want to start a traditional church? And I'm like, no, I spent 10 years. If you build a bunch of people who love the year they start and they forever want to keep it that year. Um, we started reaching out in suburban Houston. Uh, we started reaching out to people who had been left out. Um, in suburbia, there were homeless people, people losing their home, people losing their job. Um, and we gathered a lot of people because we weren't doing traditional worship, hymn book and creed. We were doing a more contemporary style. Um, what we discovered was we got a lot of people who had been wounded by poorly practiced Christianity. They weren't hostile to the idea of God. They just wanted a relevant 21st century way to experience it. I guess we were in the 20th century at that point. But they were looking at at the needs they had in their life. God could fulfill that. But we said, you know, they're kind of allergic to stained glass. That just didn't seem relevant to them. So we started, and maybe it was the entrepreneurial spirit in me. What's our niche? What can we provide in the uh the the spiritual market that nobody else is doing and we said we're going to try to hit the people that are the hardest to reach um honestly it was birthed out of my own three or four years as an atheist um and uh i think uh, it was just a struggle uh, but i wanted to answer the spiritual questions that ken had as a 24 year old sitting in the back of a church in Milwaukee, I snuck in before the church, uh, after the church started and snuck out before it ended so that I could uh, not be talked to. And I went in and I sat down and I said, okay, God, I hadn't been here in six months, make your case. And if I didn't hear anything of value, if all I heard was, oh, we got to maintain the culture of the church. Well, that's anthropology. I've taken that class. I would get up and leave. Uh, six months later, I'd say, okay, I'll give God one more shot. Let's see what happens. Um, so all this time we were starting this church in suburbia. I was trying to answer Ken's 24 year quest, your age questions um, and speak about God in a relevant way that makes sense. Um, and uh, I think after seven years of doing that, that was a great focus. But I was wore out. We had 20% ministers and 80% people who were in real spiritual need and physical need for things in their life. And that's just tiring. And so I put into transfer and took a year off before I went and started it again. And uh, I ended up uh, four years later doing it again. And uh, there's just something, there's joy in doing something new where you're unfettered and nobody's there telling you you can't do it. But we were measuring our, our work, our entrepreneurship, by the number of people that found life-giving messages that God can be a part of your life. Uh, even if you work as a dealer in a casino, even if you are in the military, you know, is God hate me because I'm in the military? You know, those questions come up and people reject faith because they think who I am is incompatible with that. And that's not the case at all. And that's not, I don't believe how God feels about us. So that's really, really, I'm powerful. just kind of, I'm just rambling now. So you tell me where we want to go. No, I, th that was all great stuff. And I, I remember uh, going to one of the s sermons that you did. And I think it was like at a middle school, because at that time we, we, we grew just enough and had just enough money coming in that we could rent out, you know, the, the middle school. So we go there and, and you, you bring a grill up onto the stage and, and start a fire <laughs> and you're burning stuff. And I was like, okay, this is something that I've never seen growing up in a, in a traditional church setting, but you had this natural knack of taking things that you could relate to that you were doing on a daily basis and, and tie it back into God's word. Were you there the Sunday that the, the I think that's the Sunday where the uh, the alarm went off because of the smoke? Yes, <laughs> we had to evacuate had, the, the school. Yeah, 
the, see, those things stick out in my mind. When you tell me you remember a sermon from 15, 18 years ago, uh, I cringe because, oh, my gosh, what did I say? Um, but that was the day I used flash paper, and I had flash paper on people's tables. Uh, and I said, you know, we're going to offer to God the thing that is the heaviest on our heart. And I, I was, you know, Mr. Science meets church, and I had a little candle in the bottom of a, a barbecue pit on the stage. And I invited everybody to write on the flash paper, you know, what it is you want to give over to God and, and kind of let go of and let God take you. And uh, one guy uh, <laughs> uh, was so excited to do this that he ran out of flash paper at the table, didn't know it was flash paper, and started grabbing the napkins. That <laughs> So everybody would come and lay their, their flash paper on the grill and the, the candles underneath it and it would poof into nothing and that was great until uh john came and laid his napkins there and set off the, the smoke detector in the room uh but we were even at that point i was hungry to help people realize if you will put it all on the table god's faithful with that and when you're an entrepreneur i don't know how you do it if you're you're not a dabbling at least on the edges of your life with being faithful to who God might be. Um, because there are moments when all you have is, I'm going to make this leap. I'm going to trust in a God I don't really know. Um, and I hope I'm being faithful with the, the resources he's given me. And I was trying to teach people that then. And it even more so to people who are out here listening to this, starting their own business. Um, God loves entrepreneurs all through the scriptures. And it's a good thing because I haven't stopped being that. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. If you don't have the passion and you're not in it a hundred percent, you know, I, I tell people that come to me and say, Hey, I want to start a business. They're all excited. A lot of times I'll try to talk them out of it uh, because I know they're just dipping the toe in the water. And it's one of those things you have to fully immerse yourself to, to have a chance at, at thriving in it. Um, I want to shift topics just a little bit, and it's yeah. it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, you know, I'm I'm in the self development realm, and there's people like Tony Robbins and Ed Milet, all these great minds, and and um, you know, all of them are are people of uh, faith as well. Um, yeah, when we sometimes we can talk about self development so much that we we forget including God in that. Uh, what, what's your perspective on that? When you hear somebody say, hey, I'm, I'm doing self-development, I'm working on me, uh, and I'm focusing on me, uh, what's your thoughts on that when you don't hear that God's somewhere included? Um, I, I do hear that. I think a lot of times there hasn't been a pastor that's walked into your life or a grandmother or a father or a brother who's given you vocabulary to say those things. I think most people, in fact, I think everybody is spiritual. If we don't hang around church, then we don't learn vocabulary to put words to what we say. Um, is it the safer Worfian hypothesis? If we don't have a word for something, then we can't think it. Um, it's, it's, a really, uh, it's a really interesting concept. But if you don't have words for something, I think the example that I I found one time was there was uh, an aborigine tribe that didn't have a word for orange. And so they couldn't see the color. Mm. They, uh, they, if they saw orange, they either labeled it as red or yellow. They said it falls into one of those categories, but because it's not that they couldn't see it, it's that they couldn't process it as its own thing because they didn't have a word for it. Um, and if we don't dabble in faith, then we don't have a vocabulary to discuss what's going on with me while I'm trying to become something. Uh, turns out God wants us to become something too and include into who we become uh, what he intended us to be. Uh, the closest thing I've been able to find is the image of me reflected in Jesus's teachings and his stories and his life turns out uh paul in the later half of the new testament says 
we were actually created to be uh, second siblings to Jesus. He would be the firstborn, and there are many others, and we are to uh, become Christ-like in our life. Um, that doesn't mean I have to die for the world. It means that that gives me a guide for how I do self development. Um, and uh, I tell you, yeah, I, th- I think God, it's hard. Yeah, I think God wants us to be our our best. I mean, He created us as a unique creation to serve serve His purpose and to to spread the kingdom and to build the kingdom. And you know, sometimes I look at you know where where I've come from. Like I just look at you know, where my business was at, where my life was at last year and how much it's changed in one year and how much more I'm able to, to go out and impact people through this. And I realized that, you know, God had me where I needed to be at that time, but that's not where he wanted me to stay either. And so I I think there's something to developing ourselves. And your goals have changed over the years. Um, even for your business, Uh, I, uh, I went a long time measuring my ministry by the number of people in need that I could serve, people that I could, uh, not notching my belt on people who were saved. I think that's an old paradigm I never did quite buy into. Um, but there, there are people who are in pain psychologically and emotionally. And if there's something that I can do in being more Christ-like, that that helps them and moves them further toward their own destiny of of looking like Christ, then uh, then that's what I've done. My one thing has shifted more recently. Um, This is for another podcast, but I went through a a few years ago, not very long ago, uh, the uh, the struggle of leaving ministry and and doing something completely new for uh, for, for a job. I didn't end up doing that, but I found release and freedom in the dying to the old self and being recreated in a new way. Um, and in the midst of that, I have shifted my one thing. I'm no longer driven by the overlap of what is my job in this case, the church, what do they want from me? There's an overlap of what do I want for me? What are my professional and, uh, you know, ambition goals? They're not bad to be ambitious. God built that into me. But I spent many, many years looking at the Venn diagram. Where do those things overlap? And I'm going to spend my time there. What blesses me that the church also wants? Well, that can narrow you down in your job to what? To, to a very narrow piece. Yes, I'm making them happy. Yes, I'm pursuing me. When I decided to quit ministry and leave, and before I realized God was opening a door for me to come back and go to the church that I'm at, St. Lawrence, um, what I've been free now to do is not worry about me anymore. There's a part of me that has been as fulfilled as I need to be and letting go of fulfilling my own needs now i'm free to go okay in the whole breadth where i was only doing what the church needed where it overlapped with my personal agenda well if i take my personal agenda out i've got the whole needs of the church that i serve before me there's actually a lot more room there for me to work and do and bless and the things that i always wanted to do i get to do more of because I don't care about me anymore. Mm. Um, now you take away my paycheck and maybe I'll have to shift <laughs> back to that. I'm, I don't want to yeah. be. Uh, yeah, that's a whole, yeah. that's a whole nother conversation that pastors should be poor. Uh, we could, we could talk about that for hours. I, I want to wrap on a final topic and yeah, uh, yeah. you know, going through the pandemic the last two years, um, being a part of the, the United Methodist church. Um, I am personally as well. I'm here in Kingwood. And just noticing the kind of the delays of getting started and the mandates and all these other things. And we're very fortunate to be in, in Texas. Uh, yet, I know you shared with me up at North, you know, not so lucky. And, and some churches even had to shut her up and may or may not not come back. Well, your, your experience in Baytown has been very unique. What were some of the things that you chose to do? 
so that your your church would come back and thrive? Um, you told me you were going to ask this question, and I didn't tell you what my answer was. Um, but I spent a huge amount of time trying to decide, okay, how are we going to approach this? Um, scripture talks a lot about not living in fear, and I have spent a lot of my life trying not to live in fear because deep down inside all of us can respond to fear. Um, and so I said, okay, rather than saying what we're not going to do, we're not going to meet, we're, gonna, we're not going to talk to each other face to face, we're not going to be anywhere near each other more than six feet. That's a lot of don'ts. And the, the news media and the culture jumped on all the don'ts. And I'm looking at a staff who are now looking at me as the new pastor. I was only there two months before, before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm brand new. They don't really know me, but they're looking to me to define what are we going to do. And the pressure to shut down was immense. And uh, the financial pressure on the church not already struggling with finances when I came in. Um, I didn't feel like I had the option to just sit down and uh, let's wait for the storm to be over. So I, I made a decision. I said, I was called to ministry. I believe God opened the door for me to come to this church for a reason. I don't want to be so arrogant as to say for just such a time as this, but I need to treat it that way. And so I said, here's what we're going to do. Within the rules given us, our bishop asked us not to meet physically. And that period lasted, I want to say, six weeks. Um, the governor asked us to not meet in groups of more than X amount. Um, we were asked to mask up. Okay, those are, those are requirements, I said, in the midst of that. I'm committed to doing 100% ministry to 100% of my people. And everybody said, well, you can't do that in a, in a COVID world. You know, we were very panicked at the beginning. I said, no, no, no. We are going to do 100% ministry to 100% of our people. We just have to be creative about it. So if you tell me you can't uh, have a youth meeting, well, I'm not, I can't accept that. We are going to do 100% for those people within the parameters that we are given. And what we wound up doing, uh, my youth director at the time, who is now my associate, we decided you need, to be, you need to be moved up here and be more broader in your ministry because he's an amazing guy. Um, uh, he found a way to do ministry under those conditions. And we did a lot of Zooms. We did things that you can do at home. I think he wound up doing a scavenger hunt around your home. So he's on Zoom with his youth doing a scavenger hunt, knowing they can find a Q-tip in their house if they look fast enough. And so while he's on Zoom, he's sending kids in their own environment where we're abiding by every stupid rule they gave us and more rules that turns out weren't maybe as necessary as possible. That we did a hundred percent ministry to a hundred percent of the people that wanted it. Um, and we got so focused on finding creative ways to get as close to a hundred percent as we could, we forgot to be afraid of the pandemic. And we are back to 80 percent of our pre COVID attendance in the last two months. Um, there are a lot of churches who didn't do that yeah you know, there's you know i think and you said it you started it out is we chose not to be in be in fear and fear i think is what was the nemesis to a lot of the conditions of the church and it's not just united Methodists; it's, it's across the board it's across probably all the the faith and different beliefs and it's impacted all of them and the ones that are that are successful and coming back and and will return um, quicker or even some of those that may have grown in this time have chosen not to be in fear and be able to figure out you know which is entrepreneurial you know figure out what you can do to manage within the environment that you, that you're in so that you're still serving well and we've been changed a lot by the last two years 
but we can say we weren't changed by COVID. We were changed by the challenges that we faced during that time. And we're coming out of it different. We're doing, you know, video worship different. We're doing all kinds of things different, but we're not doing them different because of COVID. We're doing them different because we chose to do creative work in the midst of it. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Ken, I, I appreciate you taking the time today to, to share this. And it's a little bit different than what you typically hear in a, in a podcast about business is how, how the faith component is a part of it. I'm a person of faith and, and many of the people that I coach and know are people of faith and yet that conversation never happens. So hopefully somebody hears this today and they realize that you know, faith is not over here in one box and my business is over here in another box and I can only go to faith when I'm outside of business or vice versa. And I don't have to live in fear of that either. It's okay to be the person God has called us to be and be able to share that and express that. And I, I think that's what he'd want us to do. So Ken, I, I thank you for taking the time today uh, to share your journey and share some of the things that came from the book and be able to tie that back into what you're working on and accomplishing. Um, you know, your, your congregation is very fortunate to have you. And I know that's where God's placed you uh, to be able to work in, in their lives. So thank you, Ken. Jeremy, thank you. Uh, this is exciting. And I am praying for you and the survival of, uh, of your coaching business. And I love your book. Thanks, man. All right. All right. Until the next episode, Onward and Upward. Thank you for listening to the Survive, Scale, Soar podcast. If you heard something that made a difference in your life today, share it with someone that might benefit and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Learn more about the host of this podcast and coaching services offered by Red Hawk Coaching by visiting www.redhawkcoaching.com.